welcome to the Draft Deeper Podcast. This is your host, Nathan Grubel. Joining me, as always, is my producer, Kevin Black. Unfortunately, my co-host, Cole, is not with us tonight, but our streak of guests continues as we have on someone who is very familiar with the draft world and the draft landscape. He runs his own website, hoopsprospects.com. Rich Harris. Rich, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, and uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, I, I wanted to do a little bit of a podcast here. I guess it's the hot topic. Everyone's doing their tournament reactions and their Final Four and championship game reactions, but I haven't exactly put out the, the, the draft deeper thoughts on how everything turned out. So that definitely wanted to be the focus of today's show um, and also break out some prospects from those games because we do have on a guest who, if you haven't been to hoopsprospects.com, please check it out. He has a comprehensive big board of 200 prospects. So that, that certainly means that he knows a little bit, a little something about the draft landscape. So I'm, I'm excited to dive in here, Rich. I'll, I'll just start off. We'll, we'll, we'll throw you a little slow ball here and then we'll kind of get moving a little bit. What were your thoughts as you were watching the game between Baylor and Gonzaga for the national championship? Oh, uh, I'm going to take a step backwards and talk about the final four um, in general. You know, going in, uh, I, I thought yeah, it wasn't a surprise to me that Baylor thumped Houston. And the reason I say that is because if you look at Houston's schedule, I mean, the only teams they really played uh, that were, you know, of, you know, slightly near Baylor's caliber was Texas Tech and Memphis. Um, and, um, and they also had a very easy path to the Final Four. So I actually thought Baylor was going to, you know, handle them pretty easily, and they did. I mean, it was just a god awful game. And then the second game, I also thought there was a good chance it was going to be a blowout because I just thought UCLA's luck was going to run out. And it proved to be, you know, one of the most exciting tournament games ever. And, uh, not only did that surprise me, it started me thinking about, you know, I, I came into this season thinking Gonzaga. I never got off that bandwagon. But after UCLA, I started thinking, you know, mm, yeah, I'm not, uh, I mean, okay, let me back up here. <laughs> Do you want to interject anything at this point? Because, um, yeah, I, I mean, like in terms of like the final four matchups, I think Baylor was was going to be a pretty clear winner over Houston. Just the amount of depth that Baylor has has on that team, the fact that they're well coached by Scott Drew, that that to me was a mismatch right out of the gate. Considering the fact that Baylor had had three exceptional guards all year long: a Jared Butler, Davion Mitchell, and Macy Oteague, versus Houston's two primary perimeter defenders. While they're good in their own right. There wasn't a third to be able to contain all three guards. And then obviously you have guys like Matt Meyer on Baylor who can go off at any point, Jonathan Chamwa Chachua and Mark Vital providing their interior presence. So that to me was always going to be a mismatch. As for UCLA and Gonzaga, you, you were right to definitely bring up that game because in, in everyone's mind, that's probably going to be the game of the tournament. And that's going to be the main game that everybody remembers from this year's tournament, even though, I still thought the championship game was fun, despite it being a blowout at times. You still had, in, in pretty much everyone's mind, the two best teams going at it all, all for from the entire year, right? So that that to me was still a standout game. But let, let's go. Let, let's talk about the champion team, the Baylor Bears, a little bit here, and and prospects that have definitely gotten some buzz over recent weeks, but especially after the championship game. I guess I'll start with Davion Mitchell, Rich, because I, I've talked about Jared Butler a lot on this podcast. Cole and I both have. I've talked about Jared Butler on other platforms. I, I, I have had him as a lottery-level prospect all year, and to me, that wasn't necessarily going to change regardless of his performance in the championship game or not. But Davion Mitchell had a spectacular Final Four all around, both against Houston and then in the championship game. His performance against Houston – was a little more eye-opening, I'd say, than the game against Gonzaga because he had 12 points. He didn't shoot at the best from the field, but he had 11 assists to zero turnovers. 
And that to me is an incredibly eye popping stat because one of the main questions I've had about Davion Mitchell all along is how well equipped is he to actually run an offense and operate within a system versus being more uh, of an erratic scorer who kind of plays at one speed the majority of the time? Can he act like Jared Butler in the sense of being able to change speeds, change directions, play within the flow of the offense and operate how his team needs him to at any given moment just versus just kind of being all dogs go all the time, right? So what what stood out to you specifically about Davion Mitchell in, in, in the final four as a whole, specifically in that championship game? And, and where do you kind of have him on the Hoops Prospects board right now? Um, I don't know if anything, you know, really, I watch so much basketball. So it's rare that, uh, you know, I come into the tournament and, and see something that's like, wow, you know, that's surprising. You know, you know things most you don't get you know, hard on. I mean, there are times, but not with a team like Baylor that I see so many. Um, I think, you know, the one thing about Mitchell that, that I did notice over the season as a whole, you know, is how consistent he is. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, maybe one night he doesn't score a lot, like you said, but he, he produces assists uh, or, or, or steals. Or things of that nature, and and I I do love that consistency. Obviously, his defense uh, and the way he attacks the rim, he's got some excellent body control at the rim, and he's got the ball pitch strength, you know, to to power through contact. Um, I, I think he has slow. Butler has always uh, been on uh, the top twenty or around there uh, on my draft board for this year. And Mitchell has slowly climbed. Um, I think the next time we release the draft board, which will probably be soon, probably within a week, I think we're going to see Mitchell right alongside uh, uh, Butler. And you know, when you break down their stats, they're very, uh, you know, there are differences, but when you look at their overall productivity, you know, it's very similar. And what uh, Butler is more of a shooter. And uh, Mitchell prefers, you know, to attack the rim. Um, but they both do that well. Um, and, uh, of course, Mitchell is physically stronger, but he's also two years, you know, older. Uh, he's definitely a better on-ball on defender. Um, you know, Butler is the better shooter. I think uh, Mitchell did shoot a better percentage this year. I think it was around 43%. Um, but it was fewer attempts, and uh, it was his only season. It was his first season over 33%. And also, you know, he, he's never been a great foul shooter. So, that, you know, that's somewhat of a concern. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I think what separates them really is the age. It's, you know, think about it. Let's just say we froze Mitchell in time right now, and we let Butler play two more seasons at Baylor. You know, um, you know, where would the comparison be then? You see what I'm saying? You know, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, there's always, you can always see usually in a typical prospect, you see a slow incremental uh, increase every year. And so, you know, I think right now they kind of look dead even, but when you factor in the age, I think you got to give the nod to Butler. Yeah, and, and Butler to me, it's always been his poise and his maturity and his ability to handle pressure and play within the moment. The, those traits have always stood out to me, and, and they, they bore themselves out in the championship game. Just the, the, the way that he approaches playing offense, how he's able to change speeds, manipulate the defense, use his handle as well as his variety of hesitation moves to, to kind of get himself open in situations that other players wouldn't necessarily be able to. He doesn't force anything on offense. Obviously, he's a competitive guy. He's an incredibly competitive defender. But in, in turn, the way that he manipulates the defense when he's looking to score the basketball, that also opens up some of those passing angles that, that maybe weren't there for him a few years ago. I know that last year when, when he tested the draft board, as we've talked about this multiple times on the podcast, every NBA team wanted him to go back to school and work on his passing out of different sets, particularly out of pick and roll. 
And he went back to Baylor and he displayed that all year long. And he showed off some of that passing and that manipulation in the championship game as well, let alone in, in, in the first final four game against Houston. So that that's why despite Davion Mitchell having the clear athletic advantage, I still trust Butler's all around game and his ability to process the game of basketball at, at a higher level, at least to me than Mitchell. Now, like I said, that 11 assists to zero turnovers against Houston, that's an incredible stat because it shows that when he is locked in, he is capable of making the right decisions and contributing to other areas of offense than necessarily just shooting and scoring. Even when his shot's off, he's still able to contribute in other areas. The the the, the biggest knock, other than me seeing Mitchell just want to play it at one speed for the majority of the time, he did a lot better job this year of mixing things up and, and playing at different tempos. And also having a guy like Jared Butler next to him also helps with that because they're kind of like opposites of each other in terms of how they want to play. But Mitchell doesn't attack the rim nearly as much as he should and get to the free throw line nearly as much as he should. He, he settled for so many jump shots. Yeah, that, that, that to me. That, he, that's, doesn't that's draw, he doesn't draw a lot of fouls. You know, he does attack the rim more than Butler. I mean, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, but he doesn't draw the fouls, which is odd. Um, yeah, that is that is strange. And you, usually that comes down to seeking contact. And he certainly doesn't come off as a type of guy who's shy of contact. He shouldn't be. He doesn't look it. Uh, but, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't pick up a lot of fouls. Yeah, and, and and that to me has always been a concern. And, and I, I like Mitchell, don't get me wrong. I think that I, I don't necessarily see him as a starting guard. I think that Butler is more interchangeable in a lineup because of how he plays on both ends of the floor. I think that he can be an NBA starting guard. I just I just feel that highly on him. I don't think he's going to fail in, in that regard. But Mitchell has been skyrocketing up draft boards now to the point where you have people like Chad Ford and Tony Jones coming out and saying that he's like top 10 on their boards. Chad had him as high as six. I think Tony had him as high as eight uh, on Chad I, Ford's latest podcast. Yeah, I, I just don't see uh, not somebody who's 23 years old, and six foot two. I just, you know, in all, he's only had one good year of shooting for three and has never shot great from the foul line. Uh, I just I can't justify that. Uh, you know, he's a great defender and he has a great body, but, you know, he's pure size and length. It's just not there. Same goes for Butler in that, those regards. I mean, that's what's going to hold them both back, you know, uh, is his size. You know? Can they, you know, how dominant, you know, or how successful can they be at six foot three and Mitchell at six foot two? So, yeah, um, he, he would have to be special. Uh, I mean, really special to me to be a top 10 pick and how you yeah, I kind of feel the same way. And and I personally wouldn't draft Davion Mitchell over Jared Butler. Like I said, I'm much more confident in, in Butler's game. And you are right about the size, uh, other than the age, but the size really being a concern for both of them. They don't have these overly long wingspans. They're not that tall of guards. So they don't have clear size advantages in the backcourt. But what they lack in size, especially in Butler's case, they make up for in heart. They make up for competitive fire, and they make up for immaturity. And I think that both of them are going to be able to step into the NBA and contribute right away. And they both have higher ceilings than where they're currently at in their own regard, despite them maybe not being quote-unquote star, like absolute star-level ceilings. I think they're still going to be valuable guards in the league for, for, for many years to come. So I thought they both showed out. They both played a great both, – both played great – two games in the final four. And I, I was very pleased with, with, with Baylor's performance overall. I mean, nothing necessarily shocked me. I was surprised that Gonzaga lost. I agree with you, Rich. I, I had them pick to go all the way as well. But when you just factor in, it, it seemed like it was just one of those cases where Baylor kind of heard everybody talking and, and chirping about Gonzaga. And I think Baylor just honestly came into the championship game feeling disrespected. And that's the way that they played from out the gate. And they didn't let their foot off the gas throughout the entire game. And, and when, when you bring that level of competitiveness along with their physicality 
they're they're constant wanting to just body you up, not make anything easy for you. If that's the way that that Baylor team's going to play for 40 minutes, Gonzaga hadn't faced anything like that all year. And right. I, I think the other thing that really played into Gonzaga not having more advantages in that game against Baylor was the fact that they only had one real guy the entire time that could go and get his own shot and create something for the offense, and that was Jalen Suggs. Now, yeah, I know Nembhard, that, Nembhard did a little too. Nemhard did as well, to, to his credit. But in terms of being able to consistently just possession after possession, be able to go and get his own shot, it was mainly Jalen Suggs. Like, I, I like a lot of the role players that Gonzaga has on their team, and, and, and I, would, I would draft all of them. I, I, I've been high on Ayayi all year long. I, I still I didn't let anything from the Final Four or the tournament, for that matter, take, take anything away from how I feel about Kispert. Um, Drew, Drew Timmy, I, I can't really necessarily grade Timmy until we would know that he's coming out into the draft. I'm not sold that he's going to declare. It's, it's my mindset. I think he's going to go back to Gonzaga. But Ayayi and Kispert, I, I didn't really let any of those negatives take anything away from where I have them and, and, and where I would draft them. But it was a concern, whereas in Baylor had at times three to four guys that can go get their own shot. Gonzaga really only had one of those guys. Um, and, yeah. and even though Suggs didn't have his best game in that championship, he was still the engine behind that team, especially during the second half. Like he was the only guy that could make something happen. So I kind of felt bad for him a little bit in that sense. But mm -hmm. how, how did you feel about his performance overall, Rich? I know you're high on him as well. Um, why, why, yeah. don't we get yeah. into, why don't we get into Suggs a little bit? Well, if I if if you don't mind, I, I wanted to back up because you talked about Baylor and then we can jump to Suggs. But you talked about Baylor, you know, coming in there feeling disrespected, and I think several other factors factored into the way that game went down. I think one, Gonzaga's weak conference didn't help them at all, and I think that's where it really showed up in this game. Um, you know, if it was a team like Michigan or Ohio State or somebody like that, you know, they, they wouldn't have been intimidated or, or, you know, they would have been used to it, that kind of physicality and that kind of strength. But uh, so that hurt, that hurt Gonzaga. Also, you know, there were two things, you know, during this season, you know, that, that didn't really hurt them in conference but but were somewhat of a concern. You know, going into the tournament, one is they were not an elite outside shooting team. You know, Suggs is not an elite shooter. I, I he's not. Kispert is the only one. And and then you take in the fact I don't know if you followed this team from start to finish, but they started the season with a big traditional lineup. And somewhere I don't know, maybe around uh, eight or game ten or so, um, um, Lalo got hurt. And they never went back to him starting. And they have, you know, Timmy is one of four of six foot ten guys on that roster. And I was concerned that Timmy was the only one playing. I'm like, come on, you got to groom Ballo or one of the other guys and let them get some experience because if sooner or later you're going to run into a big team, you're going to need some rebounds, you're going to need some interior defense, and. Timmy, Timmy, first of all, is not elite in either of those categories, rebounding and interior defense. And you're going to need, you know, this, this might not be the case in the, in the NBA, but in college basketball, you need somebody in the paint. And um, they had one guy, and it didn't work against Baylor. I mean, Baylor's, you know, the, the three guys they have in the front four are like NFL linebackers, really mm -hmm. tall NFL linebackers. I mean, they're huge. And um, so, and now so you, th you throw in the fact that Baylor's knocking down their shots. And when they don't uh, make their shots, they're killing Gonzaga on the offensive boards. So what happens? Gonzaga can't get in transition. Transition was Gonzaga's best offensive weapon this year. 22% of their possessions were in transition. They were elite transition scoring team. And if they can't score in transition, they're kind of in trouble, as you said. You know, Suggs, Ebhart, the only two guys really can create off the bounce. Maybe I, I use some, but he's not used to, to you know, taking over a You're game. You're not like asking that. him to do that full time, no. Right. And, and then you have one really, one real sharpshooter in Kispert. 
And so if you force them to play half court and you take Timmy away, they're in trouble. And that's exactly what happened. So back yeah. to Suggs. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I do, you know, really love Jalen Suggs. I mean, uh, I would I wish that he would shoot a higher percentage, you know, from deep. I'd say that's probably the one negative. Also, he's not ultra big, but he's, you know, he's bigger than the Baylor guard. Uh, his athleticism is excellent. His vision is excellent. His passing accuracy is excellent. And his handle, you know, uh, shaky at times, but still, I, I think it's very good. For example, I think it's better than Kate Cunningham's. Um, so, you know, you have just an excellent, uh, excellent all-around guard, point guard, and with good size for a point guard. Not great size, but good size. And then... You throw in, he just seems to have, you know, that it factor, you know, in terms of desire, uh, feel for the game, um, competitiveness. Uh, and I think that somewhat comes from his football background. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just, I, there's not much you can really knock Jalen Suggs for, especially at his age. And I think he would have even put up bigger numbers if he played in Know, on a team like Kate Cunningham did, where he was the man. So, uh, Gonzaga, especially again, you know, I really wish they would move out of the, the West Coast Conference uh, because I don't think it does anybody do, does them any good, you know, to to be winning by you know 22 points. In the and uh, I don't think the players get better. I don't think you know when they get into the tournament, it's like, uh oh, these guys are really big and athletic as us. Uh, Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. You hit on a lot of great points about Suggs, and, and, and I've thought from start to finish, he probably is the best overall leader in this draft class, and I think that Gonzaga team definitely needed him. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned Cade Cunningham. While Cade certainly has different strengths to, to his advantage, he's not that kind of vocal presence and that, that energetic, outgoing presence, I think that that Gonzaga team needed to get as far as they did, getting really close to, to almost capturing that perfect season. Uh, I think that a lot of teams would have benefited from, from having a Jalen Suggs on their unit, and, and a lot of NBA teams will, will also benefit potentially from, from having someone like Jalen Suggs on their team being able to draft him because of just how much of a leadership presence he is. Like, like I've, I've tweeted this so many times. But it's so true in that, God, if I'm an NBA GM and, and I took one of these other great prospects near the top of the draft, like, yeah, we're, we're bringing in a good talent and someone who can grow with our team. But if I'm lacking a vocal presence like Jalen Suggs and I need somebody to be a dog in my locker room or around a bunch of young guys, which a lot of these lottery teams that are up near the top of the draft, I, I guess like the Golden State Warriors, depending on how things happen with some of these picks, the, them withstanding, but a lot of these other teams are so young, they, they still need a, a, a good leadership presence in the locker room. Like, I would lose sleep if I was a GM if I just willingly passed on, on Jalen Suggs, and that's why he might not be the number one overall talent in terms of, like, who has the ultimate ceiling out of some of these guys in this draft class. He's, he's such, to, to me, a, a guaranteed commodity in, in, in different regards, and I think you feel the same way, Rich, that I would – Man, I would lose sleep if I didn't take him. Yeah, I, I've gone back and forth on uh, the number one pick. You know, uh, for for a brief bit of time, I had the G League guys, you know, ahead of Cade and Suggs. Uh, that was when I first uh, saw them, uh, you know, in G League action. But, you know, after about game three, those guys started to fade. Um and so that didn't last long. And so for the most part, I've had Cunningham number one, but there was also a period of time where I had Suggs number one. And obviously, I typically don't flip flop like this. I mean, it's usually, you know, from start to finish, I have, you know, typically have one guy number one. But, you know, if you remember, Cade, Cade went through this period where he just, you know, he just wasn't. Was, was it, he was doing okay, but he wasn't doing great. But then he got really hot toward the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And Suggs kind, of, Suggs kind of cooled off, or was it really, I, I won't say cooled off, but, you know, he's playing conference play, and, and those games were just kind of, on some level, so, you know, somewhat less meaningful, let's say. You know, 
because of the he was in and out of the lineup too a little bit this season, so that also played into it. Suggs or Cunningham? Uh, Suggs was, yeah. Okay, and Cunningham too. Cunningham missed a few weeks, so. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, it's really a tough call, and and I get what you're saying, you know, and I I said to you the other day, uh, I I I have a feeling when it's all said and done. Now, of course, we have till July. Yeah. Uh, but when it's all said and done, Suggs might be the number one guy on my draft board. I'm, you know, I have yet to sit down and seriously, you know, to this, usually up until this point in the season, I'm just watching the games and not like breaking down one individual player. Uh, I just want to get a sense of how everybody fits in, where their tiers are. And uh, our draft board actually goes close to 700 players. And there's a, there's a logic behind that. Some people might say you're crazy, but I, I have a logic to it. Um, now, I don't focus a lot on the guys, you know, like below 300 a lot, but they're there for a reason. Um, but, uh, you know, now, you know, leading up the draft, I'm going to start diving into individual players and, and really nitpicking. Uh, and, you know, if Cunningham still might come up on top, but uh, I... I as I said to you the other day, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I, I ended up putting Suggs. Yeah, Suggs, he, he had the sequence of the tournament. He had one of the best sequences when, when he had that block and then that that that, that pass in transition. That, yes. that was one of the best yes. sequences I've ever seen in my life. Oh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. And, you know, and he makes his, his ability to make long-distance one-handed passes on the break it's just amazing, you know, like some of his long bounce passes, it's like, you know, Magic Johnson, like, I mean, not many people can do that, and uh, there's another bench I see that he has over Cunningham, he's just passing, Cunningham's a good passer, and he has nice vision, but I don't think it measures up to Suggs. Yeah, the, the, the Cunningham-Suggs passing can definitely be debated, because while I agree that I think Suggs has had more impressive passing highlights this year, I think that um, sometimes when, when Cade's had some, some great cross court looks or whatever the case may be, his teammates also haven't kind of finished the job for him and they haven't made true, the shot to true. give him the assist, but no, no, that, that well, it's, it's, it's a him also average, I am also average over four turnovers a game, you know, so that's, that's a scary number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and Suggs, I, I guess to his credit too, that he coughed up the ball a little bit in terms of having a, a, a sloppier handle. In, in both of those final four games. But at the same time, I thought his decision-making really got better overall, as you kind of alluded to earlier, from, from the start of the year all the way up through the end of the year. I didn't see him playing as out of control as I saw at the beginning of the season. Like when we were talking about Suggs, Cole, and I were at the beginning of the year and, and kind of up through the middle, I said that I didn't really have many concerns about Suggs' game to begin with, but the one thing that I didn't like, and, and it, it's a dislike, but it's not necessarily something like, oh, well, I, I wouldn't rather him not be aggressive. But there are times where he was too aggressive and he would drive into who, whatever is like two, three defenders in the paint. He would he would try and make something happen where there wasn't something there. He would drive in willingly. It, it's like he didn't care whether a charge was being called on him or not. Like he just wanted to assert his physical dominance at some points in some of those earlier games and that kind of aggressiveness yeah it's a good thing like i'd rather you be aggressive than than to be passive but at the same time you have to rein yourself in a little bit and know how and when to display that athletic advantage or advantages that you have versus just constantly being in, in you know all dogs go mode all the time and just constantly letting that motor rev so that, that that was a concern, but yeah, he wiped away a lot of those concerns and some big games in this tournament this year. So that that was definitely positive for me to see 100%. Right, right. So, um, yeah, and, and I saw a lot of people, you know, you know, criticizing his handle, you know, for, for the final game. Um, and, you know, as you said, you know, things kind of got out of hand in that game, and he was the only one doing anything. And, and, and if you look at Cade, I mean, Cade, you know, I think he fumbles the ball a lot more when he's trying to make dribble moves than Suggs does. I, I just think that Suggs' handle is quicker and, and, and smoother um, and able to maneuver in tight spaces more so than Cade. But, you know, they're very significantly different in size. I mean, Cade has more of a game of like a small forward, 
where Suggs has more of a game of a point guard. So you would you would expect Suggs, you know, to have the better handle. Agreed. You know, when you're Agreed. six foot eight, what what I'm saying is when you're six foot eight, it's just literally physically more difficult to control that ball because of the distance between you know the floor and your hand. Mm -hmm. And um and so yeah, the lower the ground you are, usually the better you can dribble. So no, fantastic point. That's why you're on the show, my friend. We're we're getting into the re the real nitty gritty of the game of basketball, right? Um, now, now we went we we talked about Suggs. I've talked about Butler enough at this point. I've talked about Davion Mitchell enough at this point. I want to talk with you about a few guys who haven't really gotten their due on this podcast so far. These three guys all come from Baylor, and then after we get after we talk about these three guys, we'll we'll talk about somebody else who definitely made his presence fell in the tournament for sure. But Macy Oteague, a guard who hasn't really gotten a lot of buzz. You never really see people talking about him, despite him having some standout performances this year at Baylor. Another older guard, right? He started out 16-17 season at UNC Asheville after two campaigns, ultimately transferred to Baylor. So obviously he had to sit out a year because of the transfer, and then he played at Baylor for the 1920 last year during the, the, the end of the pandemic, well, the beginning of the pandemic, and then this year through through a lot of the tail end of it, the 2021 season. And he wasn't really viewed as one of the top two guys on the team. Obviously, those mantles were held by Butler and Mitchell, but there were some important stretches where he was able to take over and, and, and make some shots in isolation that if that team didn't have that level of shot making at that time, Baylor could have lost a few more games than they did already this season and, and may not have had as standout of a performance in the championship game against Gonzaga as they did because it's important to have somebody like Teague for when Butler and Mitchell both are out of the game for whatever reason, whether they need rest, whether one of them maybe gets hurt, whether one of them gets in foul trouble, which especially what was the case for, for both of them at certain times this season. Teague was such a mature presence for that team, a guy who can get his own shot, make his own shot in isolation, whether that's in the mid-range or from three. Shot great from the field this year, for almost 48% from the field, almost 40% from three, and 80, almost 83% from the free throw line. So he was clearly an effective shot maker for them. But Rich, I want to get your thoughts on, on Teague and kind of where you have him, because I didn't view him as this amazing second round target I think before the tournament started and you and I have certainly had conversations and we've both seen each other kind of have some other conversations with people on social media about the tournament shouldn't necessarily change your opinions in terms of like drastically raising guys up a draft board but mm -hmm. it can be a place where you can get a better read on somebody and do some minor movements, right? Like I wouldn't have necessarily thought of Teague as somebody that I had to have in my top 60, I think, or, or in a top 60 range before the season started. But to me, I think he's made his case. Like, I think he has to be drafted after the tournament he had, despite him being an older guard. And I don't know where you sit on that, Rich. That's definitely why I wanted to get your thoughts on Teague. Well, I don't think he's a lot. Okay. Um, and, you know, at his age, he's the type of guy you usually see taken at the end of the second round. And, and you use the word mature, and that's the first word I would use, you know, to describe it. Uh, and he's also very productive and he's well coached. And that's the types of guys you usually see. Uh, they take their flyers usually like in the early part of the second round. And then at the end, they're like, I need somebody to fill a roster spot here. I need a backup at point guard, or I need a backup at center, and I'm going to take somebody who's not going to be a star, but is going to, you know, be able to make my team. And uh, I think he fits into that category, you know, the end of the second round. However, uh, I have him right now, you know, in the 120s. Um, now, there's a lot of people on there ahead of him that are probably not going to be in the draft. So that's going to probably move him in the top 100. Um, can he make the top 60? You know, uh, when you compare him to Butler and Mitchell, you know, again, he's, he doesn't have the size. And at 24, he's, he's more than a year older than Mitchell. Um, so that's, that's really going to work against him. Um, and when you compare him to the other two, uh, he's not as adept as attacking the rim, though he, though 
so he does have a pretty good, nice floater game. Uh, he's not as good of a passer, and he doesn't make as many defensive plays. I mean, his calling card is his ability to shoot from deep, and and he can do it off the dribble too, which is very mm -hmm. you know very handy. Um, but there's a lot of other guys out there who can shoot and have better size and can make an overall more of an overall impact. Uh, you know, I can throw out names, but you know, let's just take. I don't even know if he's going to be in the draft, but say like a Landers Nolly, who's younger from Memphis, you know, has a beautiful, beautiful stroke. Um, you know, are you going to take Teague over Landers Nolly when Man Landers Nolly probably has him by two, maybe three inches? Um, I don't know. Um, so I, I think, you know, he, he could get drafted, but I don't see it being any better than the end of the second round. Well, let me rephrase that. So if you don't think that he's a lock to be drafted in the second round, so in other words, we're looking at him in a pile of guys that, okay, well, he doesn't get drafted with a draft pick, but you're going to want, so you're going to look at people to come into camp, right? Would you see him then as like maybe a priority guy that, that a team should want to bring in the training camp at least? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely he's going to get the shot. You know, there's no no doubt about that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not knocking his talent, but when you're talking about top 60, uh, and, and, and right now, you know, um, <laughs> I, I, I got a letter actually earlier this season um, from a, a former NBA player. Um, I don't even remember his name. I'd have to look it up. But he only played, he only had a cup of coffee in the NBA, and as he did some coaching and so forth. But uh, out of the blue, he asked me why I have Ethan Thompson so low. Now, this is the start of the season. And I had Ethan Thompson, I don't know, about 170, probably right, right about where he is now. And I wrote back to him and I said, with all due respect, sir, I, 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 think, I, I think Ethan Thompson is a great player. And uh, I, I have no problems with this game. But I, I said, which of the 169 people in front of him do you want me to take out? You know, the point being is it's not it's not that Pig is not a good player. It's just that there are other players that have advantages over him, starting with size and age, um, that you know, that, that uh, you know put him at a disadvantage. But uh there's no doubting, I mean he's over forty percent career shooter. Uh, and as we said, he can make those shots off the dribble. Um, you know, he'll get his shot um as Maybe as a late second round pick, you know, maybe as a, you know, undrafted free agent, but he'll get a shot. Yeah, and I wouldn't talk about, like, spending a pick on him in, in like, the, the, the 30s or, or, like, the early 40s. But I think it's at least, in, in my opinion, and we're absolutely okay to disagree on this, but it's in my opinion that if you're making a pick in, like, the 45 to 60 range, right, you have the ability to have somebody on the roster. You're, you're not in any kind of financial situation where you want to take maybe like a guy who's like a draft and stash player, for example, right? Like you have the ability to pay somebody, one of these guys to be on your roster and you want to bring them in with a draft pick. I think I'm absolutely considering Teague because he's not, he doesn't have great size, but he's not undersized. He's still 6'4". I believe, I believe he's 6'4", what he's listed at. He's 6'3". Say six three and a half, six four, so it's so somewhere in there, right? But he's not he, he's not he's not like undersized, you know what I mean? Like he's he's big enough to play at, at an off guard spot. He he's a smart guy, he's a mature guy. He's, yeah, he has the age and the experience behind him. He was on a championship team. He can shoot from all different areas of the floor, like we laid out, and and someone who you're able to bring in and and knows how to play the game to a certain extent. Those guys are valuable to have on your bench somewhere. And, and I think that you and I can at least come to the agreement that, yeah, if he's not drafted with a pick in the second round, I think he's at the very least moved into that priority line of guys where, yeah, you're not spending a pick on him, but you're going to bring him into camp. And, and it, it was at least my opinion, and it sounds like it was definitely yours too, given where you have him on the board, that – he probably wasn't in that line before the tournament started for, for you either. But I think he's undeniably with some of the games he had, like he had that 10 three pointer game at, at one point this year. And then his consistent play through the tournament for the championship team. I think he's undoubtedly played himself into that kind of a spot. 
And yeah, I, I, he wasn't on that kind of a radar for me. Like maybe I was wrong in not having him on that kind of a radar, but he, he, he's done that much for me. And I think that that's incredibly valuable. And, and that that's the great thing about the tournament is that some of those guys can have their cases more pronounced. And some of those mistakes, if you're going to pass on somebody like that, because of other factors that you and I went into just about how we evaluate guys and our scouting philosophies in general, sometimes those guys can fall through the cracks and, and, and you ultimately regret it. But I think with, with somebody like Teague, if it doesn't work out, if he only has a cup of coffee in the league, maybe he only has a cup of coffee in the league. But I, I personally don't have a problem spending like a later second round pick on somebody like that, even if it doesn't fully pan out for him. Because how many of those guys that you're drafting later in the second round do ultimately work out, right? Like I give Teague a higher chance than somebody who I would consider to be like a quote unquote project. And that's really all where I'm coming from as far as Teague's case. But you, you basically say you know what you're getting. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I would value, I would rather value a known commodity at that point in the draft. If I, again, if I have the money to be able to spend, and typically, I want to have them on the roster. Yeah. Typically that's what they do at the end of the second round. You know, they go for the known commodity. Mm -hmm. now, and if they're going to, if they're going to take a chance on somebody, it's usually early in the second round. Moving into one of Teague's teammates. I don't think this guy is going to come out this year. But I'd be cu I'm curious to get your thoughts on him, Rich, if he did. And that would be our good friend, a Everyday John, as they like to call him, Jonathan Chamwa Chachua, 6'8", 245, built like a brick shit house. All this guy wants to do is push people around, get physical. And I think you and I were in agreement before the championship game that he was probably going to be one of the X factors because Drew Timmy was such an important part of what Gonzaga wanted to do in half-court sets like you already alluded to. It was going to be Chachua's job, I think, more so than, than vital because of Chamwa Chachua's excellent size and his physicality of the position. He was going to have to manhandle Timmy and keep him out of the paint and, and not let him get around him with some of that footwork. Like, like he was torching the Mobley Bows at times during that USC game. Like Timmy had his way pretty much the entire length of the tournament up until he got to somebody like Chachua. And, 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 and that's not necessarily that – um, Chamwa Chacha was this guy who's only playing in the post and he's only there to be a bruiser. Like you'll see him switch out on the perimeter. He'll, he'll, he'll go up against guards at times and he won't get lost. Like his footwork and his speed, his lateral movement at that size to me is incredibly impressive. And I saw a few people say on social media, like, yeah, maybe he's not going to be known for his offense. I, I don't really think we've actually seen necessarily all of what he can do on offense because he plays in, in this tight knit role at Baylor. But he is a really, really unique, potentially unique defensive weapon. And and I'd be curious, Rich, if he was if he came out this year into the draft with, with everything that he was able to showcase this season, would you necessarily take a flyer on him at all without necessarily knowing everything he had in his bag offensively? Do you think he's that unique of a defensive talent? Or are you out on him? Or do you just you're of the mindset too that like he's just gonna go back to school and this shouldn't even be a conversation? Like where are you at on, on Chama Chachua? Uh, I'm kind of thinking he should go back to school and, you know, uh, I just don't think that his skill set is that much in man. I mean, first of all, he's not an elite, uh, rebounder or shot blocker. I mean, uh, both Vital and Zamba you know, exceed him percentage-wise, you know, in block percentage and steal their uh, rebounding percentage. So, um, yeah, he, he probably has, uh, you know, in terms of a combination of size and the ability to, you know, foot speed, you know, is impressive. Um, I just don't think he brings enough to the table to, separate themselves to actually draw any uh, attention. Well, so I will say, oh, so yeah, he averaged about 19 minutes a game this past year for Baylor. He had 6.4 points a game, uh, five rebounds a game. If you rate that out to like a per 40 minute basis, I mean, he would be averaging 12 and 10. So if you kind of try to equate that out to an NBA role, if he's at, if he's getting like maximum production as close to those numbers on a, on a limited role, like let's say he's playing like 
I don't know, 15, 18 minutes a game in the NBA. And he's, he's given you pretty much like that, that eight and six range. Maybe he throws in like a block or two in there. Like that's still a productive NBA player as far as the statistics would bear out. But he's and not going to, he's not going to give you a block or two. He doesn't even do that in college. Not, well, not in a small, he averages less than a block per game. So it's just a, I just don't see where he brings enough to the table to, to be uh, draftable. I mean, what what separates him from somebody like Amir Sims who can actually score? Uh, you know, uh, guys like that, uh, I just don't see it. Well, to me, Sims doesn't run the floor like John that, that That's first of all, like that man is constantly back and forth and back and forth. And, and maybe – the reason why he didn't average as many blocks per game as you would like to see him from in, in, in like a big man spot. He wasn't exactly always just playing this like paint rover type defense. Like he was asked to do different things that switch out of the different spots on the perimeter, which that can, ab- that can absolutely affect your rebounding rate. It can affect your block rate. So I wouldn't necessarily say that some of that isn't there to his game. I think if maybe he was in like a little bit of a different role, I think some of those numbers could change, but it's certainly not, from an athletic perspective or a length perspective or anything like that, why those numbers aren't there. You, you can make an argument that he's still very young. He's still very raw in terms he's of not, his approach he's to the game. He's 22 years old. He's well, in terms of his basketball age, his basketball age, wow. he's still on, on the young side. Not not his actual age, but um, his basketball age, he hasn't been playing basketball as long as some of these other guys, right? So that that's an argument that that's technically in his favor. I, I agree. I'm not necessarily saying that he has a case to be like a first round pick, but as somebody who could be available potentially in the second round, again, we're talking about interesting guys. You might want to burn a pick on like, I don't know if he came out, th- that'd be a very interesting decision for me to make. And I I don't necessarily have an answer sitting where I am today. I, he, he's a guy that as I'm writing some more of these profiles for, for draftdeeper.com, He's someone that I'm definitely going to consider writing about and doing a deeper dive on because I think he has an interesting case. But it, it, it's just an interesting conundrum what you do with some of these second round picks. And that's what's so fun because there's so many guys that are up that you would consider potentially be drafted in the second round. Eventually, you got to figure out what you're doing and who you're spending that type of pick on. And I don't know, just Chama Chach is just an interesting player to me. Maybe maybe he's not for you. That That's perfectly okay. But that's part of why I wanted to get your thoughts on him. Well, I, I'm not saying I don't like him. I mean, he is, he is, you know, among the players I have, you know, on my board, way down there. Um, and, uh, you know, if he was a little younger, um, you know, I'd probably be more excited about him. Um, but the fact that he doesn't rebound at a high clip, the fact that he doesn't block shots at a high clip, to me, when you look at big guys, that's the first thing you know, you want to know, do they do that? And can they move their feet? So we know he can move his feet. Um, but the other thing you want from him is the ability to block shots and the ability to, to grab rebounds at a high rate. Um, offensively, I will say, you know, he shoots his fouls at a, at a, at a nice clip. So mm-hmm. and we, he doesn't really get a chance to shoot. So maybe he has that in his game and we just haven't seen it. Um, uh, I certainly like him better than Vital or Thamba. Uh, even though, you know, some of his numbers aren't as good as theirs. Um, so there's that. Uh, I just think it's probably not going to come out, so this is probably all a, a mute discussion. But, uh, you know, I, I think if he stays there and maybe shows, you know, some more, you know, and say Vital's gone, you know, so he gets some more minutes. Maybe he gets like 24, 25 minutes a game. Um, yeah, you know, maybe he'll, uh, you know, he'll pick it up so that you know he'll catch, you know, the NBA's eyes, and, and maybe even you know can make a 15 footer. Right now, I just don't think. Uh, you know, let's take another Memphis guy, and I'm not picking Memphis guys on purpose, but you know, <laughs> somebody like Cisse or even. Uh, uh, Cooper uh, Pizza of uh, Florida State. You're not going to take. Uh, now, Cooper Pizza hasn't said he's coming out, at least not to my knowledge so far. Um, but you're not going to take uh, uh, Chachua over, over over those two guys um, because you know those guys 
well, especially Copa Visa, maybe not so much season. He's still really young. Um, you know, they can move their feet, they can block shots, and they can bring something to the offensive table. You know, they they do have, you know, er, well, not Cisse. Again, Copa Visa has somewhat of a post. <laughs> See, Moose Mo- Cisse is really raw. He, he's an incredibly yeah, raw very, prospect. very, very raw. But he's a great shot blocker, so that might just get, be enough for him to be drafted. Um, so, yeah. I will say this. If he comes out, Grant Hill will be very happy because I don't think Grant Hill pronounced his name once during right <laughs> during the forum. What the heck? Somebody didn't tell him how to pronounce his name? Like Chimichanga, you know, Chewbacca, you get it wrong every time. Have have um have, have Chucker or Shaq try and say his name, <laughs> and then and then that, that that'll be some good TV uh, on on an NBA inside the NBA show for sure. No, you 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 make you make a great point in terms of he might not be this valuable commodity, and, and yeah, you, I I agree he's probably not coming out, but I I I leave it open ended, and I'm open to having the discussion because when you win a championship, you're able to showcase your talents on the biggest stage, you have some bright spots. It it, it affects how you view yourself. It affects how other people in your in your camp view you, and and maybe you do declare or or you test the water. Who knows? But. Yeah, if Chama Chachua can come back to school and definitely showcase a little more of an offensive game because he steps into that role with, with, with Vital definitely being gone, like Chama Chachua is going to be featured a lot more in, 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 down low. So he he will have a chance to showcase a little more skill, and hopefully he does because, man, at, at the very least, he plays harder than arguably anyone else in college basketball. And they, that's just a personal preference. I love watching guys like that. So Oh, I, I do too. I- I, I love it. I love it. And people who dog it, you know, just turn me off. Um, so, you know, it, it, that I can understand your attraction. Absolutely. Now, the, the last Baylor guy that I want to talk about, he hasn't had his moment yet on this podcast, but damn, is he fun to watch. Matt Meyer. Now, I don't really hold him in, in the highest regards in terms of like, yeah, I view him as this this awesome prospect or like this first round guy or something like that. But when he gets it going, he has he has balls of steel. He has the utmost <laughs> of confidence. He will shoot it with anyone. He doesn't care when he's shooting it, how he's shooting it. And he hits some very important shots at times for for this Baylor team throughout the course of the year. Um, I really thought he could have been an X factor potentially in the championship game. He wasn't. He 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 kind of had a, a, f- a few moments, but for the majority of that game, he was actually pretty quiet, um, and that was a little surprising to me. But six nine listed at six nine, about two hundred twenty five pounds. His, his his counting stats aren't necessarily going to blow you away in terms of what he did this year. But he he was another guy shot almost forty percent from three, gave them a dangerous weapon from the perimeter. And, and and yeah, when when he gets it going, he can get on a hot streak as well as anybody else in the country. And he was just a really fun shot maker to watch all year long. And and he's gotten a little more draft buzz. People people really started to talk about him in, in like that that two thirds of the way point uh, in, in Butler's season. So Rich, I I don't know if you have any specific thoughts on Matt Meyer. I don't know if he's somebody who has gone up at, at all in your eyes, or you kind of see him as like a non-player and all this. I don't know where you stand on Matt Meyer, but I think at the very least, he was he was one of the guys that I enjoyed watching this season the most, if anything else comes from it. Yeah. Um, terrible haircut aside. Um, <laughs> uh, he's actually been on our draft board in the top 200 since his sophomore year, and I've been a big fan. Um, the one thing that always drove me crazy and probably his coach crazy is when Matthew would come into the game, everybody else would have to stand around and watch because he was like Pete Maravich, you know, doing his thing and he never passed the ball and he forced up a lot of shots and shot, shots to the logo and you do crazy wild drives, but he has calmed down and his role has increased and I love his combination of size, athleticism, ball skills, shooting ability. I think if he stays another year, he could be a first-round pick next year. Uh, 
He's going to have a lot more opportunity. He's going to get a lot more minutes. And I think he's going to put up big numbers. Uh, he needs to continue to improve as a passer and a defender. And he needs to get that free throw percentage above 70%. He was god awful this year. He didn't even hit 60. Um, but, you know, if he gets that free throw percentage up and does those other things, improves as a passing defender, uh, I, I think, you know, he's definitely going to put up, you know, 15 points a game or more next year, uh, assuming he doesn't jump. Um, it, right now we have him in our top 100. Uh, so I think there's a chance he could get drafted this year, but I think really, you know, it's one of those situations, stay in the year, get featured, you know, you're, you're going to be the man next year and that's going to, that's going to just blow his stock right up, you know? And, um, so there, there you got it. He's a player I've really liked for a long time. <laughs> I, I guess it, it, it's just a really intriguing case of if you're an NBA team, you're looking at Meyer to, to, to come off your bench. He give you a spark on offense, obviously a, a prime time shot maker. If you can rein him in, limit the mistakes, get him to play within the flow of your offense for like 18, 20 minutes a night at that size with that shooting ability, as you mentioned, with some of the ball skills, like a locked in Matt Meyer is potentially a, a scary prospect for some, for some second and, 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 and third unit guys in the NBA. Like, like how many of those bench guys really want to have to guard Matt Meyer if he's locked in on his stuff and, and he's just bombing it from the perimeter at that size like he is? like Or, or they, taking him off the dribble. I mean, he, he could definitely put the ball on the floor. There's, there's no doubt about that. Exactly. And, uh, and I, I think that's really the case that you make if you're, if you're a fan of Matt Meyer. You look at him and you say, well, if I can get the best out of this guy – and, and, and rein him in for, for, for uh, uh, an interesting bench role as a scorer, you, you might really have something there. You might have a, a potentially really valuable commodity off your bench. And, and I agree with you completely. I think if he comes back next year in, in a lot more of a featured role, those, those three primetime guards for Baylor are going to be gone. He's going to have so much opportunity to shoot within the flow of the offense and, and, and do some of those off-the-dribble isolation-type moves, take people off the bounce. He's going to be able to showcase that he has every shot in the book because I think that you and I would, would agree that he, he pretty much does have every shot in the book. Like He, he was hitting some runners at times even during, during the season where I was like, oh, like he, he's not just a jump shooter. Like this, this dude can make shots off the move. And he also proved that he could play without the ball in his hands. You know, he yep. made some nice, nice scores and cuts. And uh, I could see him move a little more off the ball, you know, as a catch-and-shoot guy. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, th I think he can do it all offensively. You know, defense is obviously something easy to improve on, rebounding, passing. But, I, you know, as, as, as far as reading him in, you can already see that happening. You know, just from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. You know, in the tournament, sometimes I actually thought he passed up shots. You know? He did. And, he did. You know, and I was game. like, wow, is that the same kid? I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and that just happened over a matter of months, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think he's starting to get it. And I think he has a lot of potential. Absolutely. And, and, and I wanted to talk about some of those guys because – when people bring up Baylor and they're talking about potential draft guys and you're just talking about how good of a season they had this year in college, like you, you really only hear it's, it's Butler and Mitchell, right? It's Butler and Mitchell, Butler and Mitchell to death. And you don't necessarily hear all the conversation about some of these other guys, but the fact that you and I are able to have what, what I would consider to be fairly intelligent draft conversations about some of these other guys that have cases like that just showcases the depth that this team had all year long. And it's, it's why they won the championship and, and did the Houston and Gonzaga two excellent teams all year, what they did. And we had, we, we mentioned vital a little bit in passing. We didn't even really talk about him. Not that you and I think he's an NBA guy, but he had eight offensive rebounds in that championship game. And it's like, you just look at, you just look at Gonzaga and it's like, you're going to let one guy get eight offensive rebounds. Like, are you that's, kidding that's, me? Like, yeah. I think that's more than Gonzaga had as a team. <laughs> Like oh, I'm serious. It, yeah, it's, I think it it's, was sixteen. I think it was sixteen to two or something like that in that game. It it was a it was a crazy rebounding disparity. I think overall rebounds it was like thirty four or thirty five to seventeen. Or oh, but I was talking about like offensive that. boards. But offensive boards, Baylor, yeah. With the, yeah. I think Baylor had sixteen, and I I don't I think it's I guess somewhere between two and four. And that that to me was it wasn't even just the shot making 
off the bounce. I guess like if you really wanted to point to two things that I really thought turned the game in Baylor's favor and it let them, it, it, it let them never let the game get close. It was their shot making off the bounce because Mitchell and Teague were just making everything they looked at. And then, and then Butler got involved in the party and then the rebounding, just the fact that they were that physical on the glass. And it seemed like every time one of those Baylor guards missed a shot, Vital was there to pick it up and, and yeah, he was able to put it back or pass it back out. Timmy's not even a great rebounder, you know, in the West Coast Conference. And then you put him against, you know, those guys that are still, you know, like NFL players. Yeah, it, that's what I would say. You know, Mark Few made a huge mistake by not grooming at least one of those big guys that he had sitting. And we're not talking just chumps. We're talking about top 100 recruits. He's got three of them sitting on his bench. And... uh uh, the young kid, the real young kid who just un reclassified. I uh, can't remember his last name, Ben. Ben Jones, but he's one of them. Uh, but they have Balo, who's seven foot and probably goes about 270. And then they have a European guy who's also a seven foot. Then, you, you know, he just let them rot on the bench this year. And then when he needed them, he couldn't call them. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you 100%, my friend. You're not going to have any arguments from, from me on, on that front. That was definitely a downfall of the team. And Mark Few is one of the best coaches we have, and he's certainly going to learn from, from some of the mistakes he, he made towards the end of this year. And, and that Gonzaga team is going to come back. Who, whoever he brings back in the war with him and, and who he has in the fold next year, they, they'll be a competitive team, no doubt. Absolutely no doubt. So we're, we're, we're going to wrap up this show. I know there's definitely one guy that we wanted to have some words on, and that was Johnny Juzang out of UCLA, absolutely skyrocketing his stock in, in, in some people's cases on some other boards. To me, I don't think he necessarily like skyrocketed. I always viewed him as a prospect. I, I think in terms of how high you want to view him can be a discussion or something that's up for debate, but Rich, why don't you get into some of your thoughts about Juzang that I think you mentioned to me that you, you wanted to talk about some guys who ended up just moving significantly during this tournament process in general. Yeah, I, I think he was one of the, first of all, I think it's much easier to improve your stock in the tournament than it is to hurt your stock. And I'll give you an example with uh, the kid from Walt Roberts, you know, Maximus. With him, um, you know, he's the leading scorer in the nation and, uh, you know, put up nice numbers for assists. And if he had a crap tournament or if they were eliminated in game one and he only scored 10 points, he wasn't going to, his draft stock wasn't going to fall, you know. But what was going to help him was if he could push his team along for a couple of games and put up big numbers in the process, which he did. And so, and I think, uh, you know, the biggest winners in this were, were certainly uh, him plus uh, Jaime Jaquez, Johnny Juzang, UCLA, both of them, Buddy Behind, uh, Isaiah Mobley, and uh, Dijon Giroux of Houston. Uh, I, I think Giroux, maybe not so, it's just as much by his play as by when he played hurt, you know, uh, especially in that Rutgers game where they almost he almost didn't make it to the final four, you know, uh, and, and he played in extreme pain. And um, so I think that won some people over right there. So I think all those guys, but Juzang uh, certainly, uh, you know, with his shooting um, is intriguing, especially at his size. And the thing of it is, is he started the season really slow. Uh, and there were a couple of times where he was nagged by injuries. So, I, again, I'd like to see him come back, and if he can end the season, if he can, you know, go through an entire season like he did, uh, you know, in, in the tournament, uh, I think, yeah, you're, you're looking at a potential first-round pick. This year, you know, overall, he only shot 35%, so, you know, uh, you know I don't know how people are going to view that. But he certainly, he's also one of these players, and there's a lot of players in the draft this year. Ahai would fall into this category. Uh, kid from Boise State, um, I'm drawing a blank here. Regardless, we, we've, we've made a case right, that there right. are definitely people but, who have helped their, their, their stock during the tournament. Well, no, but. no, no. I, I would say what I was going to say is these guys, uh, you know, like say Beheim and Juzang, you know, they don't do much other than shoot. Teague, Teague falls into that category too. So, 
you know, that's that's what they're not complete all around players. That's why I have Hakez higher than Juzang on my board and have for quite some time is because, you know, Hakez brings everything. He brings the effort, he brings the defense, he brings the rebounding, he brings the shooting, scoring inside, outside. He does a little bit of everything and, you know, he does it with energy. Um, and so I prefer those types of guys. It, it depends on the situation, but the specialty guys certainly have their role in the NBA. And shooting is is probably the leading specialty teams look for. But you know, uh, is evaluating a prospect early on. I ask, you know, how many things can they do well? And uh, so Juzang kind of falls into that shooter only category. That that's exactly the point that that I really wanted to to get to the bottom of with Juzan and Rich. I'm glad you made that point because when when you're talking about a guy who's skyrocketing that far up draft boards, and and there are some people who want to put him like mid first round, late lottery, like mid to late lottery, whatever the case may be, but. Juzang's no always way. been a prospect to me because of the shooting and his size, but I was never necessarily sold on his overall scoring package, right? There's a difference between being a shooter and a scorer, and, and I'm, I'm assuming by your answer that he didn't necessarily prove that he is this awesome scorer as much as he is well, just a shooter at that size. I, I, well, I, I guess I should take a step back there. That's what probably impressed me most in the tournament because I, I don't typically see the West Coast teams as much as I do the East Coast or the Midwestern teams. So one thing that impressed me is how he was able to get to his spots. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that part of his game was more developed than I thought it was. By the way, the kid I was trying to think of was Derek Olson. Derek yes. Olson Jr., actually. Um, but yeah, that, that part of his game impressed me, but I, he's not he's not going to be a first-round pick. I, well, I mean, I suppose, and maybe, but definitely not lottery. Um, and I, I highly doubt, you know, again, it depends on how many people pull out, you know? Um, how much advantage does he have over Beheim? Um, you know, they're similar in size. Uh, I would say, I would say, actually, you know, they both can make shots off the bounce. Um, I don't know. I mean, would you favor uh, Beheim over? I'm, I'm not or? buying the Buddy Beheim stock. I'm, I'm not buying into that love story. That, that's just me. But I, 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 I the thing is, I've always viewed Zhu Zhang as a prospect. I agree with you. He shouldn't be taking, shouldn't be skyrocketing up the board just because UCLA made the Final Four. He did some right. impressive things in the tournament. I think a lot of that. When you talk about how he got to his spots, I think that was just how Mick Cronin ended up setting up the offense at times, was that he knew how to call plays and get guys in spots where one half of the floor was completely cleared out for him, and then they were kind of left to just do their own thing. And to Juzang's credit, he hit a lot of tough shots in big mm -hmm. moments in isolation from the perimeter. But in terms of having enough in his bag to be able to create and get something closer to the basket – all the time and, and being able to really take guys off the bounce and show something a little more diverse in his, in his scoring package that I'm not completely sold on. And that's why I'm not going to skyrocket him up a board by any means. I'm also not really in love with, with some of his technique and, and how he approaches the game defensively either. I, I, I think right, to me, if right. you're drafting Juzang, I think you're, you're drafting him as a shooter and an offensive weapon in that mold. If you're drafting him to be something else, something more, you might be leaving a little bit on the table, but he's one of these guys. I mean, he was a sophomore, right? He, he was, he was able to transfer yes. right away from Kentucky. He didn't have to sit out and, and lose any time. So he has age and time on his side. So he might still be able to add some things to his game that we don't necessarily know of or can predict right now. And he may come back to UCLA next year, blow us away even more, maybe average closer to, to what some of his outbursts were like, let's say he puts up like 22, 23 points per game at UCLA as more of a featured weapon, you know, the, then we're talking about somebody who I would feel much more comfortable projecting up a first round, depending on how he's getting those baskets. But yeah, to me, I, I agree as well, Rich. I think he needs to come back to, to school and definitely showcase a little more variety to his offensive game. And defense. You know. and, and defense. defense. That's right. So All around. It definitely needs to improve. Um, but of the six guys I mentioned, you know, Hawkins, Juzang, Amiz, Beheim, uh, Isaiah Mobley, and Giroux, 
I think it, all of those guys, I mean, as it stands, would not be drafted. I think Mobley has the best chance. But again, imagine him coming back now that he seems to be playing with more confidence and he's hitting the outside shot with, with more regularity and he'd have a chance to bulk up a little more. You know, you could, if he gets drafted this year, it's going to be definitely in the second round. If he came back next year and lived up to his original, you know, recruiting status, because I think he was like top 12 overall. I think he was like 12. He, he the, was a well-known guy coming out of high school when he did. Right, absolutely. right. And he wasn't, you know, he was almost as highly recruited as his brother. Uh, I think there you're looking at, you know, he could become a first-round pick if he comes back. Um, there were other guys too, you know, that, that made nice bumps and certainly, you know, made their name known, I think, in this tournament. They, most of them didn't have long runs, but um, Wiggins, of, uh, Aaron Wiggins of Maryland, Ethan Thompson that, that I mentioned earlier of Oregon State, Arkansas's Deontay Davis, sometimes they call him Devo Davis. I was <laughs> very impressed with that kid. Uh, you know, Santa Barbara's. Uh, Corey McLaughlin and uh, Greensboro's Isaiah Miller. I think all those guys are now on the radar um, and should be on everybody's radar. Uh, they all have different strengths and weaknesses, but uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely improved from the tournament as well. I agree. I agree. Um, and, and, and a lot of guys who, who probably need a little more seasoning, like to me, I think that like the top, or at least if I had to lay out, like, cause we're not really like a, a, a big board kind of program over here like yourself. But if I had to lay out a path for like 60 guys that I think that in my mind, they should be drafted. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very crowded race already. So I agree with you. I'm not sure how many more names we can really throw into that hat reasonably. Um, I guess before we wrap, you, you mentioned Acemas. Where, where do you, where do you kind of see Acemas? Cause to me, I'm, he, he had a great run of the tournament and, and, and towards the end of the regular season in college, don't get me wrong. Like, he had some outstanding performances, but he he doesn't necessarily stick out in my mind more than some of the other guys I would kind of put in like that that thirty one to sixty range that I would look at drafting. Or, or did he really impress you? Uh, you, you know, he had some he had some nice games early in the season. It's Texas Tech, Oklahoma. Uh, I think he played uh, another Big Twelve team, and for the most part, he did really well against those teams too. So he holds his like, own. Yes, right. It wasn't like he wasn't on the radar before. Uh, it's just at that setting with those teams, with teams like Ohio State dialed in and having everything on the line, it made that made what he did even more impressive. Having said that, we're still talking about a six foot one guy, okay? And we're and uh, and so yeah, he has proven that he can score against high level competition. But I, you know, some people are calling him a first round pick and I do not see it. He's only a sophomore. I think he's only 19. Uh, if he's 20, he's barely 20. And I, again, I think he should, you know, come back because I don't see, you know, why it's the recent, the recent bias is, is you know, it can be uh, very crazy making. Just think about it. I mean, what is so much better about his game than, say, a Remy Martin or a Kendrick Davis of SMU or, you know, somebody like that? I mean, we're, we're talking little, quick guys who can score from all over the floor, have deep range, and also can, you know, can take it to the hole and score in, in different ways. But we're still talking about a six foot one guy. And um, so, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, if he comes out this year, he has a chance in the second round, um, but uh, I don't think it's a lock. And uh, like again, just another guy. I think it's best to wait one more year. Well, Cole wouldn't fight you about Remy Martin. That's his guy. That that that's been his guy <laughs> for a while. So he he wouldn't fight you on that one. But um, Rich, that that's really gonna do it for our show this week. Thank you so much for coming on, my friend. I that that was that was definitely a very engaging back and forth conversation. About we hit on a lot of different guys throughout throughout this podcast. Maybe didn't do like quote unquote deep dive on every name that we brought up, but we hit on a lot of guys on this show, and it was incredibly fun for for my audience. How can they find you on social media? How can they find your work, my friend? Because they need to go and look at it. All right. Well, the website is hoops hoops. Floral, prospects.com. Uh, we have 
as we talked about, we have a, a deep draft board that goes 200 deep in mock drafts and scouting reports and so forth. We're kind of just gearing up for that. Uh, for the most part, we've been putting all our energy into the big board so far. Um, and uh, on social media, you can also find me at hoops prospects or at hoops prospects on Twitter. Beautiful. Well, again, thank you everyone out there for listening to our show every single week. Your 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 comments, everything that you guys are able to convey and and talk with us about on social media is awesome. That's that's a big reason why we do this. We want to talk to you guys. Remember to follow us on Twitter at Draft Deeper, like the Facebook page, subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're we're everywhere we need to be and. I am so excited because now we're, we're really in the, the meat and potatoes of draft season. All the live games have calmed down. Now we get a chance to reflect on all of our thoughts from the season, but then also look at some of this tape with a fresh mind, not having to keep up with all the night-to-night narratives and everybody putting out different thoughts on social media. We can all kind of get in our own rhythms and evaluate things how we need to with, with, with fresh eyes and minds. So I'm really excited for what we have coming. Starting this coming Monday, we are recording this on Thursday, April 8th, but starting this Monday, April 12th, we're going to be having profiles up every day, Monday through Friday, somebody new on our website, draftdeeper.com. We're going to have the profiles fully up and running, and we're going to be doing that for for months, and we're going to have plenty of engaging content coming on the website as well as on the podcast. So stay tuned, everyone. Thank you always for listening. Have a wonderful rest of your week.